I'm going to paraphrase because I don't have a lot of time. But there's nothing wrong. We think you don't need a warning. And if you're going to warn, warn in all your cars. And by the way, Kosh, this is what you should change your warning to. Point number one, always make sure that all occupants are wearing their safety belts. Nothing about buy a latch plate, buy a lock plate. Nothing about that. Nothing about consider a five-point seat belt. We make them for kids, Ford says. Why not give humans choice? Why not give people choice to have a five-point seat belt? Why not give people choice to have a latch plate? Why not give people choice to have a cinch plate? Why not? They give it to their test drivers, and they give them more structure for the roofs. Why not tell people, go back to your Ford dealer and have foam shot into your A and B pillars and into your headers and sideliners. They're hollow, like, like a sardine can. Like a sardine can. Fill them up with foam. And then you're going to have the strength of a roll bar roll cage. And then you're going to be locked down where you, your excursion is going to be limited to two inches. And if we limit your excursion and we limit the def deformation, your head's not going to hit the roof when it rolls over. And you're not going to be injured. Why not do that? Because if they I'm sorry. if they did, wouldn't sell cars. Profits over people. We asked Al Darrell a lot of questions. Oh, 216. 216, by the way, compliance with the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards does not mean if they comply with them, doesn't mean you can't sue them. It uh, doesn't mean you can't find against them. And the court's going to give you that instruction. You can consider it. Uh, but if they acted unreasonably, or if the vehicle was defective because they didn't provide a safe occupant space, or because the seatbelts weren't safe enough in a rollover situation because it was up to them to make them safe and they never did it, or because they didn't roll properly test the cars in rollover, real world rollover situations, or because they didn't warn people, you can find against them, even if you find they met the 216. But let's look at 216 and see what it's really all about. When I asked Al Darrell, this is Ford's guy who works for a company uh, that's made millions of dollars testifying for Ford, he made a lot of admissions. He said, 216 is a minimum standard. That's the Speedo standard. They don't test with a dummy, so there's no safety analysis in a 216, no occupant safety analysis. It's not a rollover test. It is not dynamic. So when you ask, you know, what kind of rollover test did you do? None. What kind of rollover test did you do for roof integrity? None. What kind of rollover test did you do for uh, seat belt effic efficiency in a rollover? How much excursion? Nothing. Not a rollover test, not dynamic. It's quasi-static. Does not measure injury. Remember, I said, how long does it take to run the test? And it's a flat and pushing, putting pressure down 120 seconds. Remember that? And we waited 120 seconds. And you compare that to what a rollover takes. Is it a blink of an eye? Some people said two blinks of an eye. Is that a real world comparison? No. Real rollover takes one to two seconds. Roof deformation begins in one twentieth of a second. Really fast. Now, the defendant is trying to make this argument. They're trying to say, well, you don't break your neck, not you the jury, people don't break their neck, um, because the roof deforms. You break your neck because you're on the roof. Who cares? They're liable. Whether, they pro whether a person broke their neck because it rolled over and the seatbelt didn't stop them from rolling over and they didn't tell me that could happen, or because the roof deformed is irrelevant. But they're trying to make an issue of it. They're trying to define that as, well, if it broke this way, then it's okay. How could that be okay? How could you be, have knowledge for 30 years, since the 60s, and, and the dive theory, since the 70s and 80s, know that, and say, well, that's okay? How could that be okay with Ford? 
That's not okay. It's not okay. Especially when they know how to make it safe. Remember when we asked Mr. Caulfield, uh, and I showed him the little scientific drawing? I got it here. I'll show it to you in a second. Uh, you know, what do you got to do? Well, we got to keep the head off the roof. Well, how do we do that? Well, you need a seatbelt that limits excursion, and then you eliminate um, roof deformation. Is that something? This is a defendant's expert. Paid millions of dollars. Can you do that? Could you do that in the 90s? What was his answer? Yes. We could do it. You know what's very interesting? This is very interesting. Nobody from Ford measured the roof deformation in the Felipe vehicle. You notice that? None of their engineers. The biomechanics didn't do it. The engineers didn't do it. The seatbelt guy didn't do it. Nobody did. Nobody. Engineers with tape measuring sticks. You saw the measuring sticks in the pictures. They measure the deformation. Why? Well, here's why. 216 allows up to 5 inches, right? 5 inches of deformation. The deformation in the Felipe vehicle was 11 inches uh, dynamic, which comes back to about 9.5 inches. All right, so there's a difference there of 4.5 inches. So they didn't want to say, well, uh, the standard, quote unquote, the Speedo standard, allows us 5 inches. But this one was 9.5 static, dynamic, 11. What does that mean? It went way in, way in to the survival space. That's the problem. So how do they get around the problem? We're not going to measure it. And we know, because the only evidence in this particular case was that if you did a comparable drop test, that's about an 11.6 to 12 inch drop. 11.6 to 12 inch drop. That's about 5.5 miles an hour. Five and a half miles an hour. And it got nine inches of crush. Static crush. Like that. And that's what happens, folks, when you don't have real, real world rollover tests. When you don't have real world rollover test to test roof strength. That's what happens. Because they can get away with it, and they do, because the government didn't make them do it. Now, let's talk a little bit about the, the NHTSA. Remember uh, when NHTSA was talking about imposing the minimum standard? Ford knew in 1968, well, we're not going to uh, tell them about Weaver. Weaver said it should be two times the weight of the vehicle for rollover strength. NHTSA wanted to do one and a half times the weight of the vehicle. So they wrote, didn't tell NHTSA, hey, we know it should be two times, because that's what Weaver told us. They, uh, they write and say, nah, it should be one time. It should be the weight of the vehicle, nothing more. And then they wanted to apply it to trucks. And they fought that and said, no, nah, we, we don't want to apply it to trucks either. It shouldn't apply to trucks. And that was coming around. And that's the one applied to trucks. Nah, it shouldn't be applied to trucks. Not a good idea. It doesn't measure anything. It's not safe. It doesn't protect. And then uh, NHTSA wanted to take a look. There's a 5,000 pound limit. So trucks are heavy. They wanted to keep the 5,000 pound limit. They didn't want to go one and a half times the weight of the truck. So trucks are heavier. They wanted to keep that 5,000 pound limit. Maybe they fought against the 5,000 pound limit. No, no, no. We don't want to have the 5,000 pound limit. They don't want to be regulated at all. They want to do whatever they want. Now, what would happen? If the government didn't even have a minimum standard, what would happen? We have what we got with the seatbelts. Seatbelts are not effective in rollovers. The three-point seatbelt without a locking latch cinch plate, not effective in a rollover. Guess who's guarding the chicken pet, the chicken house? The fox. That's a problem. 